Well, I'm going to ask you to turn over to Hebrews chapter number 11 this morning. <clears throat> Felt very clear this week as I was seeking the Lord's direction for the service this morning. Very clear direction to, to, uh, uh, to bring you a, a second part of a sermon that I preached a month ago. And we only talked about, in that sermon, we only talked about Gideon out of this verse. And so, uh, to put it aside, haven't felt the Lord's leading to go back to this. But very strongly this week, I believe this is the word of the Lord for today. Uh, and so, I want, to, I want to endeavor to minister. This is a stand, it might be, it might have been in my original writing, the second part of a sermon, but I, it is a complete standalone word, message uh, for today, I believe that is going to minister, minister to me this week, and I believe it will minister to you as we hear from the Lord today before, uh, before we go home. Uh, Hebrews 11 and 32, just one verse, and then we're going to look at several other scriptures, but it says, what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, or Jephthah. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help me this morning to bring the word exactly as you have given it to me. Lord, let it be for these people what it was for me this week. Manna from heaven, strength and nourishment from your Holy Spirit. Do the work that only you can do, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, when I read that verse, there's a lot of thoughts about exactly what kind of literature is Hebrews, you know, is no doubt it is the anointed word of God, but I believe that it is a sermon. I just, when I read Hebrews, it just reads to me like a sermon. And when we get to chapter number 11, this preacher has already been preaching uh, for a while. And he realizes that his letter is already long. His sermon is already long. There's other things that he wanted to say. And so he's saying, I don't even have time to really lay out the story to you about Gideon or Barak or Samson or Jephthah. And it strikes me when I read this because it's right at the end of the great hall of faith where he's laying out the, 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 the monuments, the Mount Rushmore, if you will, of faith the great examples, and then at the end, he tags on Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, who are four names that we don't normally associate with being people of great faith, because these folks, when we talk, when you study and read about their story, they were all flawed individuals. They were flawed individuals. Gideon, we talked about a month ago, you know, Gideon... Uh, Kept laying out the fleece. Well, Lord, really, really, really? And so he, he had some doubt, fear, and unbelief in his life that God was, was, was calling him to do such a great thing. But yet God did a great thing uh, through him. And so the story of Gideon can help us uh, when, when we struggle with doubt and fear and unbelief. You know, I've grown up around a number of, I guess they're more charismatic than they are true Pentecostal. Because they say you absolutely negate everything God's trying to do if you have any doubt, fear, or unbelief. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been around people like that, but you say one negative word and, and you're going to get sick or you're going to get, you know, you're going to get in trouble. You're going to, God's not going to be able to bless you because you had a negative thought or a negative word. Folks, I see all over where God takes people who are struggling and still uses them in mighty ways. Because they didn't stop in their struggle, but they just kept going. And they kept moving forward. Even if it was at a snail's pace, they kept moving forward. So this morning, we have another example that I believe is going to help somebody. It helped Travis this week. We're going to talk about Barak. Barak, as I read this, I said, Lord, he was a timid fellow, wasn't he? <laughs> he was a timid guy. Here he is, we're living in the time of the judges, and Barak's story is found in the book of Judges. And when you see him, you don't see a man of great faith. 
You don't say, oh, Lord, give me faith like Barak, you know. That's just not one of those guys. We might say, give me faith like Paul or give me faith like, you know, uh, Peter after Pentecost or faith like Abraham. But I've never known anybody that said, give me faith like Barak. I've heard some faith like Caleb or faith like Joshua. But, but here he is. He was a man of timid faith, but God still used him greatly. Once faith replaced Barak's timidity, God got the victory. And the people were able to enjoy the spoils of the victory. So my point this morning is God uses flawed people to demonstrate His grace. So when the victory is won, God gets the glory and not us. That's how He uses cracked pots, flawed people. That's the the title of, of these messages is cracked pots because first or second corinthians 4 and 7 says we have this treasure in clay jars so that this extraordinary power may be from god and not to us it's not about the vessel it's about the god who fills the vessel and folks let me tell you i think there's two dangers let me address very quickly the first is thinking of ourselves more than we should Like, well, that church has to have me. That church couldn't do anything if it wasn't for me. If it wasn't for my presence, if it wasn't for my knowledge, if it wasn't for my money, if it wasn't for me, that church would just have to close and and fold its doors, you know? That's, That's one side of the story. And sometimes people who are extraordinarily blessed with musical talent or preaching ability or financial wherewithal, that's, a, that's a, a catch that they can fall into, thinking, well, that church needs me. I'm, I'm, I'm this great vessel. What would they do if I didn't pay my tithes over there? Well, uh, the best I ever heard address something like that was years ago. I was watching uh, T.D. Jakes on television, and he said, some of you just think that God couldn't even have church if it wasn't for you. Your ability to give or your ability to sing or your ability to worship, your ability to pray. Some of y'all just think that God couldn't even have church if it wasn't for you. He said, let me tell you something. You get to thinking that much of yourself, there's some, there's some homeless person somewhere here in Dallas sleeping under a bridge, sleeping off two bottles of wine that he had last night. That God can save today, clean up tomorrow, having church next week, and they can do more than what you can do because they'll have the anointing of God on them. (laughs) Yeah, the old picture of take a bucket of water, stick your hand in that bucket of water and and, and pull it out and, and see how long the hole stays there. In other words, we don't, we, Paul says, we're cracked and, and broken vessels because the glory of this thing, the glory of the church, the glory is the greatness and the goodness and the power of God. And none of us are bigger than what God is trying to do. And we can't think too much of ourselves because God, look at, uh, was it, uh, was it uh, Nebuchadnezzar who got to looking out over the, over the city of Babylon? Uh, one, of those, one of those big name kings in the Old Testament that, my, my, look at what all I have done. I've built this city and I've conquered all this land. God struck him. And he went out and lived like a beast in the field and ate grass and grew fur and claws and spent years wandering around as an animal until finally he lifted up his eyes and repented of his pride and then God restored him to the kingdom again. I'm telling you folks, none of us are bigger than what God wants to do. But let me throw the flip side of that because more often with Travis, it's not thinking too much of myself, it's thinking too little of myself. Because I think about all the things I can't do or don't do well. I start thinking about all the cracks in this vessel and the areas where I wish that God had made me a little different or, or, or given me a little bit more. And I start thinking about all the cracks. And Well, I can't do that. Well, I can't preach like Jimmy Swaggart. And I can't, I can't give altar calls like uh, Billy Graham. And, and I can't uh, pray uh, for people uh, like, uh, uh, like Benny Hinn. And, and 
<laughs> whatever, you know, whoever, we start thinking of all the things we can't do. Let me tell you, it's about God and His power that works in and through us. And it's not, hey, about our ability, but about our availability, being able to be available for God to use. So that's where this comes from when I talk about cracked pots. Barak here is a cracked pot in that when the message, let me not get ahead of myself, but when the message of the Lord came to him, he was like, oh, not me. I can't do this by myself. I got to have some help in this project. And so we'll get to more of that. Now, you've got to understand that when you hear the name Barak, almost everywhere except here in Hebrews, You're going to want to couple another name with that, and that's Deborah. Because Barak's story wouldn't have been much of anything had it not been for Deborah. Now, we look at this passage of Scripture with a 21st century Western mindset, and it's a little hard to understand why this is a big deal. Well, let's go back a few hundred years before Christ to the time when this actually happened. And you've got to understand that women were nothing more than a a cattle or sheep. Uh, they They were not on the same societal peg with men it was men and then you know the kids and and the women were were below uh, the men and they were uh, could be anyway a totally different mindset I, I understand that in our culture there's still not uh, complete equity between the sexes but there's a whole lot uh, closer to being equality in our culture than there was in the pre-christ uh, old testament culture where women were Basically, the property of the men. So, you've got to remember that. You've got to think about that. And some of the things I'm going to say, ladies, don't get offended. Because I'm talking about their culture, not our culture. Okay? So, here it was. Who is Deborah? She's not his wife. But she's the only female judge that we read about in the book of Judges. So when people say today, oh, I don't believe that women ought to be able to lead churches or preach or, 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 or do th- certain things in the body of Christ, we can go all the way back to Judges and we can see how God used Deborah to be a great champion for the Lord right here in this story. Now, this is an indicator that God will use anybody for his plans. Amen? People may think that certain classes or certain groups of people are not worthy, but folks, God looks beyond what we see on the outside, and he knew where Deborah's heart was, and he elevated her to a position. In a day where a woman was a possession, God said, that's the one that I'm going to use to lead my entire nation out of captivity and into victory. And so here we go. You see, it's a, it's a sign of, uh, in this culture, in that culture of the day, of how far Israel had slid in their apostasy. Because God had set this thing up where there was a, a, you know, a priesthood and, and leaders, and, and he had done so through Uh, Moses and then through Joshua and then those that followed him and he had a structure and leadership in place but the people kept rebelling and after a period of being under oppression he'd send a new leader in and he'd give them victory and they'd be good for a little while until that leader died and then they'd fall back in again and now things have gotten to the point where God can't find a single man to lead them out of victory and he's got to go now don't Throw rocks, don't crucify me, because I'm talking about their way of thinking, not ours. He can't find a man to step up and do a man's job, so he's got to get a woman to do it. Right? There you go. So he, uh, this is no knock on Deborah because she's a brave, decisive, and bold leader. But folks, she judged Israel because none of the men would step up and do what they were supposed to do. Mm, church let me tell you we all in Christ there is no male and female there's no bond and slave there's no uh, you know no distinction we need to rise up and do our part guys we need to do our part in the church we need to do and that's no knock on ladies in the modern terminology because many of our assembly of God churches wouldn't even still have the doors open 
if it hadn't been for ladies stepping up and leading in the churches over the years, teaching and cooking and cleaning and doing all the things that they have done. So I'm telling you this morning, as we look at this, after 20 years of humiliating oppression at the hand of the Canaanites, God raised up a prophetess, a woman, to lead and represent him to the people. But since Barak was the guy who probably should have been in his position leading Israel, God said to Deborah, you tell Barak, the commander of the army, I've got the game plan. You tell him, I don't know if I can divine this the way that I want to without getting you confused. I hope I can. Barak was in the position as the leader of Israel's army where God should have been able to speak directly to him. God should have been able to speak to this man of Israel and say, hey, buddy, you're in the position. You're the leader. You've got the bars on your shoulders. You are the one who say, hey, guys, God give me the game, gave me the game plan. Come on, we're going to go. God's going to give us victory. But Barak wasn't even hearing from God for himself. So Deborah says to him, hey, I've got a message for you. And we'll find that in uh, Judges chapter number 4, verses 6 and 7. Deborah says, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and of Zebulun, and lead the way to Mount Tabor. I will lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and all his troops to the Kishon River, And I will give him to your hands. Man, on one hand, that's really simple, isn't it? Here's what you do. Here's the number of troops that you take. Here's the tribes you get them from. Here's where I want you to go. This is it. All Barak has to do is rally the troops, march them out to to Mount uh, Tabor, and be there ready for God to do what God wants to do. But check out what Barak says in response. Verse number 8, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go, I'm not going. (laughs) Now she says, divine this with me. Think about this for just a second. Y'all go get General uh, Barak and bring him in here because I've got a word for the Lord. He comes and stands before this woman of God and she says, Sir, the Lord God of Israel has spoken to me and he has said, I'm sick and tired of these foreigners oppressing the people and the time for deliverance has come. You're the man. Go gather the troops, march them to this spot. I'm going to bring Sisera and the army over and I'm going to defeat them so that Israel is free and you'll get the glory for a great, uh, uh, for a great battle. Now, nowhere in that does she say we, Right? She doesn't say, Barak, we, 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 W-E, we, not yes, yes, yes in French, but we, meaning I'm included in this. But she says, I've got a word for you. And his timidity shows up when he says, I hear the word, but unless you go with me, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to do it unless you go with me. You see, it was his job to saddle up and face the enemy But he won't even go unless Deborah goes with him. So unless you think I'm being too hard on Barak and his response here, look what Deborah says in verse 9. Very well, Deborah said, I'll go. But because of the way you are going about this, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. You're supposed to be the man, buddy. But since you're so timid about this, I'll go, but you don't get any of the glory. A woman is going to get the glory for this. You know, in a day in which honor and glory was the high mark, nobody wanted to be dishonored. Nobody wanted to have a bad thing. They wanted the honor. They wanted the glory. It was all about the accomplishment and the glory that could be won in battle and in combat and in society for the men. Deborah says, okay, we'll do it your way. Since you don't want to do it God's way, we'll do it your way, but you're going to miss out on the blessing that you could have received personally had you done things 
God's way. Now, I can partly understand Barak's hesitation. Here he's got this ragtag bunch of soldiers, although 10,000 sounds like a lot of folks. He knows that he's going to be numerically disadvantaged. Sisera's going to have more. Number two, Sisera is going to be trained for battle, and his guys are not. I mean, they've been under the domination of Sisera and the army. He's not going to be letting them drill and practice and get ready to make war. So numerical disadvantage, tactical disadvantage. Then Sisera, we're pointed out in this scripture, has iron chariots. And Barak has nothing. Foot soldiers. That's like taking a bunch of infantry out against tanks. He knows there's no way, there's no way in the manual that this works. There's no way in the book that this works. I've got a numerical disadvantage. They're better trained and they're better equipped than me. There's no way that this works out. So I'm not going to go unless you go with me. (laughs) I'm not going to go out there unless you go with me me into this battle you know maybe he's thinking you're sending out a bunch of boys a bunch of ill-trained men with pocket knives against the enemy that's rolling around with horses and chariots what in the world can we possibly do against an army like that well for the sake of time let me skip ahead they go out deborah says i'll go with you they go out They're out there at Mount Tabor. Sisera comes in with his army of soldiers. They're all spread out, and God sends a storm that floods the river, the Kishon River, trapping the iron chariots where they can't be of any use in the battle. And it turned into a slaughter, a rout, and a total victory for the men of Israel. Sisera, in the midst of all this destruction of his army, you know, he runs away from the battle and he tries to find some place to hide and he finds this woman who lets him come in to her shelter and he says, I'm worn out from the battle. I'm, I'm, I'm running for my life. Let me lay down. Hide me in here for a little while until I rest and I can escape. Sure, come on in, she says. And she lays him down in a place. She says, I'll keep the door. I'll watch the door. Make sure you're safe. Sisera, exhausted from the battle, lays down and quickly is asleep. She gets a tent peg and a mallet and she nails his head to the floor. (laughs) She ends it. There was Sisera. Nailed to the ground with a tent peg through his temple. Not killed by Barak in battle, but by a woman in a tent. (laughs) A woman in the house, you know. So even though Barak led the troops in battle, Jael, the woman who used the tent peg and the hammer, she gets the credit along with Deborah. Was Barak a bad guy? No. He was a good guy who was just too timid in his faith. Give him the credit he deserves. He's listed in, the, in, in Hebrews chapter number 11, the great hall of faith there. He's listed there. But he was timid when he should have been a strong leader. All right, that's the Bible story. You say, yeah, but what does that mean? How does that apply to us? How is that meaningful in my life today, Pastor? Well, number one, God uses the most unlikely people to resist evil, and to restore righteousness. So make yourself available to God. God uses unlikely people. We can talk about shopkeepers and and poor people and, and drug addicts and just common everyday people from obscure backgrounds who were nothing before they made themselves available to God and then God used them in mighty ways to see great victories in his kingdom. We can talk about Barak. We can talk about Gideon from a long time ago. Or we can talk about uh, uh, more modern examples uh, of of people who were obscure. But they made themselves available to God. And he sent them to places and used them uh, in mighty ways. Uh, 
one of the uh, examples that just pops into my mind right now uh, is uh, the, the great uh, healing evangelist of, of a few decades ago, uh, Catherine Kuhlman. Uh, she didn't have a heritage or a background or a position or a degree, but she had an availability to God. And even in a time when they, in, in Pentecostal circles, looked down on women who were trying to minister, she just started having her own meetings. She started doing things at her own place, and God brought people across her path, and Catherine Kuhlman did mighty miracles of God, of healing and of ministry, because she made herself available. Church, I'm trying to tell you the enemy would like to tell you you don't have enough health or enough time or enough money or enough learning or enough Bible study. You don't have enough. You can't make a difference. And God says, I'm not concerned about what you already have, because I've got plenty, and I just want to get it to you. If you'll just be available to witness, if you'll just be available to preach the word, if you'll just be available to lay hands on the sick, if you'll just be available to call on those who are down and out, if you'll just be available to, to, to be used by me in whatever way I want to use you. Oh, but Lord, I can't. In, uh, in ourselves, things are impossible. But in God, all things are possible, and God can use you if you'll give Him the opportunity. He uses the obscure, and He uses the reluctant. <laughs> look, look at some of those Old Testament stories. you got a fellow who God says, I want you to go and preach a great revival. I intend to save a, a, a major metropolitan area. He says, I don't want to go. I don't even like those people. I don't like them. I don't want him to get saved. So he went down to the coast. He got in a boat. He went down to the bottom of the boat. And he said, take me as far away from here as you can go. <laughs> Didn't get very far. Ends up in the bottom of a, the sea in the belly of a fish. But when he repented, God had him deposited on dry land. He went and preached. The city got saved. And was he rejoicing? Look at what you did in me, God. Oh, wow. Nobody's ever been used like I've been used. No, what does he do? He goes outside the city. He has a temper tantrum. And he says, see, that's just what I said. Those people deserve your judgment. And instead, you saved them. And, right? I mean, he, hey, God still used the brother. Who am I talking about? Jonah, right? God still used him. You get Peter, who's been following the Lord around for two and a half, three years. And Jesus says, guys, I'm going to the cross. And Peter says, oh, no, far be it from you. You're not going to die. No, sir. And then on the night when he is arrested three times, Peter denies that he even knew, knows Jesus. But yet, who is the brother who stands up? on the day of Pentecost and preaches the first Pentecostal sermon, it's our brother Peter who got forgiveness of God and the fullness of the Holy Spirit and preached the first message. I'm telling you, God uses the obscure. God uses the reluctant. God uses the unlikely and he uses the unappreciated. It's not about the valuation and the esteem of men. It's about whether you are making yourself available to God. And God doesn't measure you by any other human being. He measures you by your response to his word. He's not measuring you by any other yardstick. That could get really discouraging, couldn't it? Because we could always find somebody else who we feel like is doing a better job than we are. But folks, he's measuring you by when I have spoken, have you made yourself available? Oh, oh but you know, I, I have such a hard time and, and I struggle in my faith and, and I'm, I'm worried that I'll mess up. Look at what he did with Barak. With Barak, who was timid in his faith and said, somebody else go with me. Barak was still used by God to be the man who took the army to the right place at the right time and victory still came. Church, I want to tell you 
Sometimes we hesitate. Sometimes like Gideon, we want another sign. Oh, God, give me another sign. Oh, God, give me another sign. Sometimes we got to say, I know you asked me to go alone, but I got to have somebody to go with me. I'm telling you, God is looking for us to say, I am available to you to be used by you. Even when we have some fear, even when we're more timid than we ought to be, it doesn't, it doesn't negate the blessing of God when we, in our fear, go ahead and take the next step. Somebody told me years ago, and I have found this to be true as I have lived it out in my life, courage is not the absence of fear. Used to think that courage, you know, the John Waynes and the Clint Eastwoods, man, those guys were just born without a fear gene. You know, they, they just don't ever fear. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is going ahead and taking the next step even when you are afraid. Even when there is some fear. Even when you're not sure of the outcome. But you go ahead and you take the next step anyway. Lord, I'll go. You know, uh, Job could say, if he slays me, I'll still worship him. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm still going to do what I know is right, even though everything seems to be falling apart around me. I'm still going to go. It, well, I know we talk about Peter sinking after he got out of the boat, but he's the only brother who got out of the boat and took a few steps uh, on the waves. Uh, he was willing to get out. Uh, and what happened? He didn't die. Jesus saved him and rescued him and pulled him up out of the waves. I'm telling you, church, uh, that uh, if God can use a fellow like Barak, and if he can use a fellow like Peter, then, oh, my goodness, he can use you if you'll just Make yourself available to him to be used. God may use just one person to rally everybody around him to the victory. In 20-something years of being a pastor, I cannot tell you how many times we were in a revival or just in a regular Sunday service and it seemed like things were just bound up and not moving. And then one person would begin to really worship God. Or one person would get up and go to the altar and it rallied the whole church just because one person stepped up and said, I'll just go. I'll just do it. I've seen instances where one person looked at the person beside them and said, I just feel like I'm supposed to ask you, will you go to the altar with me? Just one person was willing to say, well, nobody else is going to worship, but I'm going to go ahead and worship anyway and began to worship. Or one person would say, I'm going to go down to the altar. Even though I don't need to be saved myself, I'm going to go. Even though I don't need prayer for myself, I'm going to go. And it breaks through. It breaks through the, the spiritual hindrance. It rallies people around. Uh, you see, you may be, I'm here today to tell you, I feel this very strongly in my spirit. You may very well be the one to lead your family to breakthrough in the spirit. Because you're willing to go ahead and take the next step anyway. And God says, do it and you do it. You may be the very one to lead Eastgate to the next level of anointing and breakthrough because your availability where you say, here I am, Lord, use me. I know I'm a cracked pot and I don't have it all figured out and there's chunks missing out of my life. But God, I'm available. If you'll use me, I'm here. Oh, use me, Jesus. I know you won't refuse me. I'll do whatever I can to serve you. The second thing is God has a specific plan for victory. So listen and follow through. You see, Barak knew, as I was saying, Lord, this is a hard message to preach because you're talking about timidity and, and it's a hard, exactly, you know, what do I say? And he, he didn't go on by himself. He had to have somebody come with him. And Barak knew that he was not hearing from God himself, but he knew Deborah was. So he said, you go with me. I believe the Holy Spirit showed me something this week that I have never seen in this passage before. The fact that, number one, Barak wasn't hearing from God for himself when he should have been. And number two, he wanted to be sure that the prophetess was with him. The voice of God was there. The one who was hearing from God was right there. So that if he got halfway there and the army started giving him trouble, he could talk to Deborah and say, what does God have to say about this? Right? If he showed up at battle and, and things weren't going very well, 
He knew he wasn't hearing from God, so he could turn to Deborah and say, Oh, what about this? Things aren't going well. And somebody could touch God for him. Mm -hmm. That excites me just a little bit to think about that. So often, we think we have a better plan. God's ways can seem Ill, impossible and even illogical to our ways of thinking. You know, God says, take the first of your increase and give it. Bring your tithe unto the storehouse. That isn't even, that's illogical. It doesn't make sense. But for those of us who are tithers, we know that it works. It's illogical, and it doesn't make sense, but it works. When we pay our tithe, when we honor God first, God blesses the rest. You know, uh, well, I only get one day off from work, and I need Sundays to rest, and, and I just don't think I could work the six days of the, of the week without taking Sunday to just rest, and so I can't go to the house of the Lord because I'm resting. I have found that when we come and we worship God, we find that our rest is not reduced, but it is increased and it is multiplied when we give to the Lord. When we worship God, isn't it weird how that works? But it works, doesn't it? You, you, those, some of you are clapping and nodding your head. You know what I'm talking about. It works when we honor God, when we do things God's way. See, somebody's sick, you know, and, and they come to an altar and they say, the doctor said A, B, and C. How in the world does taking a little anointing oil and placing our hands on somebody and praying a prayer of faith, how does that change diabetes or cancer or, or, or the cold or a flu or whatever else is going on? It makes no sense. It's illogical, the laying on of hands. But yet even medical studies that have been done show that there is power in prayer. When people pray the prayer of faith, the sick are relieved and healed and sins are forgiven. Why? Because God's Word says so. I could go on and on, but I think you understand that Isaiah 55, he says it like this. And I love this passage of Scripture. My thoughts are not your thoughts. <laughs> nor are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. I have a strange way of thinking about things a lot of times. I understand that. Every once in a while, Rhonda and Caleb just look at me and roll their eyes. You know, I understand that. I have a strange way of of thinking about things. But I remember as a kid reading that verse and thinking about it and trying to make sense of how higher God is than us. And I thought, you know, I wonder when you encounter an ant what it can comprehend and perceive of what you are. Just eensy, teeny, tiny little ant crawling around. Even if it gets on you and starts crawling, what can it really comprehend of, of what a human is? I would think it could comprehend very little of what the sum total, you know, you got this little tiny fraction of an inch creature and this six foot tall person that weighs 200 pounds. I would think it could comprehend very little of what the whole is. That's probably not a good analogy, but it made sense to a little kid of me as the ant trying to comprehend a God that is so much bigger than I am. He says, don't try to wrestle your brains and your intellect and try to figure things out. Just trust me. I'm God, and my ways are not your ways. Who else could say, let there be light, and light exists? Who else can say, let the seas be full of fish, and the seas are full of fish? Who else can say, let the night be divided from the daytime, and it was? Let the seas go this far and no further. Let the mountains raise up this high and no further. Who else? Nobody but our God. We have no reason not to trust a God who has done everything well. Even when we can't comprehend it, God has a plan. So when God commands, God empowers. So we can trust Him. Because we're trusting in God's strength. When God says, get up and go across the room and witness, God's going to empower that conversation. When God says, make that phone call. When God says, go pray for that person. When God says, hit your knees and just pray. 
God is going to empower us. When God says stand up against a wrong, make right something that has been done wrong, whatever it is that God speaks to us about doing, whether it's witnessing, going on an outreach, going on a mission trip, whether it's whatever it may be, however big, however small, when God speaks it, don't be like Barak and be timid about it. If God commands it, God empowers it. Barak, Deborah, or Jael did not win the battle that day, but God gave the victory. They just got to be a part of, used in it. They got to be partners with. When we pray around the altar and God heals somebody, it wasn't our prayers that healed them. We get to be a part of it. It's exciting to lay your hands on somebody and they say, praise God, I got healed. It's exciting that a few months ago in worship service, God touched Richard's back and took away back pain. That's exciting to me. None of us had anything to do with that. That was all God, amen? But doesn't it excite you to know that we were a part of the worship service where our brother got a touch in his body? It's an exciting thing. What God commands, God empowers all Barak needed to do was trust the Lord. He had the promise of victory. When God goes before us, who can stand against us? <laughs> when God goes before us, who can stand against us? So we need to courageously engage the enemy in our life wherever he shows up. It's not a huddle in the corner and hope for the rapture scenario. Shouldn't be. We should be courageously facing and engaging the enemy. Why? For our sons and our daughters, for our grandkids, for our next door neighbors, for the next generation of children that are being born in this country. Folks, I'm almost 50. I've seen a whole lot of what I consider to be negative change in our country and even in the church just in my recollection. Those of you that are older than me, you've seen more than I have. What can we do? We've got to engage the enemy for the sake of the future generations. We've got to fight as though this is the last day that we have to fight, but we've also got to prepare that God may not come back just quite yet and that there may need to be another generation that comes along behind us and keeps the church going for another generation. So it's kind of a both and situation. But here's the scripture that I want to give you about this. Romans chapter number 8, another one of my favorite passages. Romans 8 says, We know that all things work together for good to those who love God and who are the called according to His purpose. Listen. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, those he also called. Who he called, those he also justified. Who he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? There's some really deep theology that would take me a long time to dive into the depths of, of what Paul wrote right there when he talks about predestination and all of this stuff. So let me just say it as simply as I can for the sake of today's sermon. Paul said, God knew about you before you ever knew about yourself. And he already had a plan for your life. And his plan was to make you like Jesus. His plan was to justify you and glorify you. In other words, Paul said, God has plans. And if God has plans, nobody can stop them. Nobody can stop them. Folks, and, uh, I'm challenging you and encouraging you today the way the Lord has encouraged me this week. It is about God. It's not about you. It's about the glory and the power of God. It's not about you and it's not about me. But God allows us to be used by His purposes and for His glory. The same as Barak, the same as Gideon, God allows us to partner with Him. Folks, God's plan is going to roll on. I can either be with God 
and be used and enjoy the blessings of God, or God can set me aside and use somebody else. God's plans aren't going to be stopped just because I won't cooperate. I'll be the one who misses out. If Barak had said, no, I'm not going, I imagine God would have just sent Deborah on down there to do it herself or raised up somebody else to take the place. Wouldn't have stopped. God intended to bring victory and he was going to do it. God intends to bring revival and renewal into your life if you'll just let him. Why? Because this world needs revival and renewal. But if you won't make yourself available and allow him to, it's not going to stop from bringing revival. He's just going to pour it through another vessel. He's going to bring it through another channel, and you'll be the one who misses out. Oh, is that a negative thing to say? I don't know if it is or not, but it's the truth. I don't want you to miss out. I don't want to miss out on being used by God. I believe God has a plan for me. I believe he has a plan for you, and I believe he has a plan for all of us together, and I want everybody, as Eastgate begins to move forward and to see things happening in the Spirit, I want everybody to be enjoying the blessings and not wondering, where'd everybody go? <laughs> right, man? So I want you to be available. Don't be timid. Don't be, don't be overcome by timidity or fear, but to know that God says, let me be your point man, because nothing will get by me. I believe the Lord is saying, what are you facing today? What's holding you in a place of misery and bondage? Barak, Deborah, the whole nation of Israel was in a place of misery and bondage. They were being held there by the enemy. I believe God may be saying to somebody, what's holding you in a place of misery and bondage? I know he was speaking to me earlier this week. Maybe he's speaking to you. God says, here it is, cry out and ask for deliverance. What was it? What was it that moved God to set Israel free from Egypt? They finally started crying about how bad things were, crying out to God. And he says, Moses, go. It's time. In the cycles of, of slavery that you read about in Judges as you read through that whole book, I believe it's the same story. Things would get bad and keep getting worse until God's people began to cry out to God for a deliverer and say, this is too bad, we can't handle it anymore, we need help. And then God would send a deliverer. I believe the spiritual message for you today is cry out to the Lord. Is it pain? Is it disappointment in people? Is it disappointment in the way your life has worked out? Is it some kind of difficulty? Is it a spiritual attack? Is it your own failures and you feel like you've just blown it and made a mess of things? I don't know. It feels like it's got you under bondage where you're not living the way that God wants you to live. I'm not saying you're necessarily out in sin or you're in, 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 you know, in rebellion to God but you're not experiencing the victory and the power and the anointing that, that God wants you to experience. Cry out to God. Hey, Lord, I'm tired of this depression. I'm tired of this discouragement. I'm tired of, of always feeling like I'm the, the heel and, and, and not the head. I, 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 I'm feeling like I'm always victimized and not the victorious. Cry out to God. And then stand by and await your orders. See what God will tell you to do. I don't, want to chase, I don't want to chase a trail right here, but I feel like I need to give you an example of what I'm talking about. There have been times in our life where we were in financial bind, and it was just always weighing on your mind because of the, the financial troubles. And there have been times when crying out to God, Lord, what do I do about this? Should I go get another job? Uh, you know, what should I do? What should I do? Lord, give me direction. There have been times when God has said, Take on a part-time job. And then God has provided that job where I could work in addition to the pastorate. And it didn't, you know, the outside job didn't interfere with the ministry. There have also been times when God has simply said, I want you to give what you do have. And out of our limited resources, we would write a sacrificial check 
and send it to a missionary or give it to our church or, or plant it somewhere where God said do it. And God would bless. Why doesn't he do the same thing every time? Because we would think we had the formula figured out if he did the same thing every time. Oh, well, I've got a financial problem. Well, that means I need to run out and get a job. Well, maybe that's not God's will for you right now. Oh, I've got a financial problem. Maybe I just need to zero out my checking account and put it in the church. Maybe that's not God's will for this particular time. What he wants you to do is cry out and then do whatever he asks you to do. You understand the difference I'm trying to make there? That's just financial and that's a personal experience from us. God's always been faithful to answer. Are we willing to do what he asks us to do? I'm not going to go down and dunk myself in that old dirty, nasty river. We got better rivers back home. If I got to dunk myself in a river, I'm going to go back. <laughs> now, now, if God asked you to do something difficult, wouldn't you have done it? Naaman had to say, okay. Doesn't make sense to me, but I'll go dunk myself in the river. I hope you understand the story I'm bringing you there. Naaman had leprosy and he went to see the man of God and he said, go down to Jordan and dunk yourself seven times and God will heal you. And he got offended because that's a nasty old muddy yucky river. I don't want to go down there. He had brought money and possessions and wealth he was pl planning to give, not go get dunked in a river. But when he did what God asked him to do, God healed him of the leprosy. Are we willing to do what God asks us to do? Those who share the responsibility also must share the honor of trusting God. It's an honor to be able to say, Lord, I can't do this. When I try to witness to my kids, they just get angry and won't talk to me, and I, I can't do this. I need your help. God, when I try to balance the checkbook, I just get frustrated and, and upset and worried because there's, not a, there's too much going out and not enough coming in, and I, I need your help. Lord, when I try to get over this pain in my body, I just get frustrated because it's still there day after day. But Lord, I know you're my healer, right? That's what I'm talking about. It's an honor to trust God. So this whole account emphasizes one last point. God is calling us to resist evil and to restore righteousness. Resist evil. Sickness, evil, sin, anything that's not of God, resist it in the name of the Lord. Even when it doesn't make sense, we resist those things that are not of God and we restore righteousness. What is righteousness? God's way, God, God's plan. That's righteousness. We do what God asks us to do. Will you call out to God for his deliverance? Will you believe God with me for the impossible? Will you listen to God's call to engage the enemy in your life? Will you follow God's means to victory? That may mean fasting, prayer, giving, going, doing. Whatever God asks you to do, it may just mean standing still and waiting until God says, I'm going to take care of this. So many different ways that God can lead us, but are we willing to do what he asks us to do? God uses unlikely people like Deborah and Barak, people who are timid, people who struggle with their identity in Christ, <laughs> people who struggle with their courage, people who struggle with their obscurity. One more scripture, and then we're going to pray. Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house that you could build for me? And wherein is a place that I may rest? For my hand made all of these things, thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look. Wait, God's saying, what can you possibly do for me? Heaven's my throne, the earth is my footstool. What could you possibly do for me? But listen, he says, to this one I will look. To him who is humble and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. God says, you can't possibly do anything for me. I created you and everything in the universe. But here's what I'm looking for. Humble, contrite spirit, 
trembles at my word. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that this message will make sense to those to whom it is needed today. That it will be a source of encouragement as it was for me this week to everybody who needs to hear it today. And that, Lord, before we dismiss and go our separate ways, that you will give the same encouragement to others that you gave to me this week as I studied and prepared for this message. That you would touch today, God, and move today, Lord, as only you can. We pray, God, right now that you would bless and move in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This morning, will you stand with me before we go? I want to give you the opportunity. You know, we didn't come to hear a speech, but we came to worship the living God. And so this morning, this morning, I want to give others the opportunity, just as Richard has, to come to the altar. Maybe you need to just come and, and call out on God for deliverance. Call out on God for strength, for peace, for patience, whatever it may be. Maybe for healing. You just have a need today and you need to come before the Lord. Would you come right now as these altars are open? Would you come right now? Make your way if you have a need. Hallelujah. Maybe you can come and pray with Brother Richard this morning if you don't have a need for yourself. Maybe you just want to lift your hands and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Thank you, Jesus. Spend a season in prayer before you make your way out. And we just ask you, 